So the first record that I've done was a group called Spectrum City, my DJ outfit, and it was me, Chuck, and Keith. And we went in and we had a producer produce the record, you know, and the producer that we had produced the record, you know, he produced the record in a way which, which I was like, okay, you didn't, he didn't take any chances. He didn't do anything that I thought was, was different from, the, from uh, having the same cookie cutter approach to the last record that he did. So I said, well, let me go in and let me kind of like do something that, you know, with the remaining time that we had, I think it was like four hours in the studio. The record that, that was originally done was about 116 beats per minute. The record that I did was about 90 beats per minute. But so that that BPM, I mean, now 90 BPM, that's kind of like, yeah, of course, that's where, that's where yeah, it sits. Right. But, that's, so that, that but, wasn't... but that was revolutionary at that time because everything was about 110, 115, 120, you know, beats per minute. You know, that was your, your norm on radio. So, so I just said, like, I didn't really care about radio. I wanted to do something that I knew that felt comfortable on the street level. So then, so, so bringing the beat down to something that was like 90 made it easier for the rappers to put in more lyrics or more words now. Now we can, we can go, we can, we can, we could talk about more things that are more relevant that's happening that, that we could say more than you could say with a normal pop record or a normal, you know, R&B record. This uh, sort of takes us to your time at WBAU. It was almost like you basically ran out of material to play. So you guys were like, all right, well, <laughs> we got to fill airtime. Exactly. <laughs> so let's make some let's make some demos. You know, but we didn't we, we didn't we didn't know they were, you know, we knew they were I knew they were demos, but we needed to make records to play because we wanted to play all rap records. And I would get, you know, 35 rap records, you know, within uh, 3 months. You can't keep playing the same records all the time. So we had to come up with something, you know. So I would just bring in local rappers, you know, and just have them come in and just, oh, you know, just say whatever, do whatever, just put some rap on these beats. Nobody sees, you know, when you're on radio, nobody sees the format that you're using. All they do is hear the sound. And, and, and lo and behold, one of the records that, that we did was actually a pause tape ended up becoming one of the top records on the station that was public enemy number one that just shows you the power of 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 being able to to put something on the airwaves that was done on doing a pause tape which is what every kid was doing in their house but never had the opportunity to have it played on radio a pause tape is basically is basically using the, the the tape machine as a sampler. So so what you do is you take a record and you would you would find the the, the, the part that you wanna that you wanna you know record and you just record those two bars and then you pause the tape and then you wind it back and you do it again and you release it and you pause it again and you keep doing that until you build up this three minutes or four minutes of this loop so to speak. But with a pause tape, you can also create like parts where it, it changes. So, so you could do that as well. But you can hear the glitches in it if you listen really closely. You could hear the, because the, every now and then you don't catch it exactly right. But the key to a great pause tape is being able to catch it so that the, the glitches are minimal, so minimal that it almost seems like it was on purpose. Another thing that happened was I stumbled across filtering from, from a defect, basically, that happened in the SP-1200. The 1200 was playing a sample back, and the sample didn't have, it didn't have the full range on it. And so what happened was, it, it, all I heard was it sounded muffled. You know, and, 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 and so this is, a, this is an hour in the studio like trying to figure out what happened because I'm like, I'm, I'm bugging out at this moment. I'm saying like, yo, okay, this is costing me time, but this sample is so important that I want to sound full range. Why didn't it sound full range? And come to find out that, you know, Eric came in, came into the studio and just and then started jiggling with the, with the jack, boom, came out full range. 
So now I said, wait a minute, hold up. Pull that out again. So he pulled it out halfway. You got this muffled sound. Put it in again, you got full range. Okay, I want to lay a track down with the muffled sound and then another track with the full range sound. All right? And have them run simultaneously. And so when I got to a certain point, I could drop out the full range sound and have the muffled sound rocking. Okay, these are things, those are things that, that, that was discovered just by an accident. There's times when we were in the studio and, you know, here we have, uh, 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 we have this riff that's two and a half bars long, but we only need it to fit within, the, within a bar. What do we do? This is where, you know, the, the idea started coming. Well, okay, well then, well then take a hit from here, take a hit from there, and take a hit from there, and let's play those in those parts. So instead of it, 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 it embellishing itself out to, that, to, the, to the full two and a half bars, well, maybe we condense it to just what the meat of it, which is... Dun, uh, uh. The 808 had what I consider to be the worst sounding kick drum ever. Uh, until you did something like release the sustain on it. When you release the sustain on the 808, then it became something interesting. But at the same time, at, the, at that time, nobody knew wh you know, what it was for. And one of the things that I wanted to do was, was, was take that particular concept and, and put like a, a, a supercharger on it, you know, and do something else with it. You know, how many different ways can I take that sustained sound from an 808 and use it and manipulate it so that it almost becomes uh, it almost becomes the bottom end for your entire project or for your entire record. When you're sort of creating these new rules and you're slowing things from 116 to 90 BPM and you're working up this noise-based theory of production, the did the first person, first people you played to, did they go? Partly like, people go, uh, but most people say that sounds like the worst shit I've ever heard in my life. I look back now and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and when I see like, you know, the albums that we've done back in the days and people say how great they were, you know, today, you know, so to speak, I, 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 I'm still pinching myself because when I first delivered those records, those were the worst records ever, you know, and, and, and to the record companies and everything. Because you have to, you have to think now, you're, you're, you're talking about the, you know, the, what was acceptable standard then an acceptable standard was musicality you know and and ours was the total opposite of that it didn't have any musicality but at the same time it had a lot of music musicality to it but the musicality was in listening to the records the little samples and snippets and everything else that was inside it which the which which the you know the people that we was bringing it to they didn't understand you know, thank God that we was working with cats like Russell and Rick, who were pioneers, and they understood that. These guys were the, 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 the guys that were blocking or, or running the interference for all the major labels. The major labels, they thought it was just sheer garbage. That we, we was, they thought this stuff was, I, there were so many situations that people said, this stuff would never sell, this stuff, because first of all, nobody wanted to hear political rap. That's number one. Uh, the other thing is that nobody wanted to hear all this noise. This stuff sounds noisy and distorted. There's no way that you can, that, you know, that I could use the same rules that, that for example, that uh, 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 Molly Maul was using for his groups or Herbie Azar was using for Salt and Pepper and Kid and Play. And when you listen to a lot of those records, those records sounded correct. Those records, the, the chords were, were nice. They, 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 even though that, that they, they were rapping, but, but those records were, were, were well constructed in, in a way that, that, was, that was, to me, more pleasing and more comfortable to you. I didn't want to do that. 